Pre-Med Office Hours, episode 185. Hello and welcome to uh, the best hour on YouTube all week long, anywhere, no matter no matter what. Uh, better than First We Feast, uh, better, better than Hot Ones, uh, better, better than anything and everything. That's what I think. I don't know. Uh, my name is Dr. Ryan Gray, the creator of the Pre-Med Years podcast, Pre-Med playbook series, medical school headquarters, all that good stuff. Uh, and I am joined by Courtney Lewis, former director of admissions at Burrell College of Osteopathic Medicine, mm -hmm. all around awesome person. Uh, okay. How you doing, Courtney? <laughs> sure. I'm good. I'm good. I'm excited to be here on Valentine's Day. I know this can be a hard day for a lot of people. I couldn't agree more with that comment. <laughs> so um, try to. Baylor's sucking up. He's like, will yeah. this help me get into med school? We like it, Baylor. <laughs> we like it. Put in the hard work. All right. I'm ready. We're ready. ready to go. Um, so I have a little bit of an idea for today. Um, okay. Maybe doing a little bit more topic based. Um, okay all about kind of the application because that's the kind of season we're in uh yeah. is the application timeline um adam here has a question about the activities uh okay. is there criteria for when an activity should be listed with quote repeated dates can't find specific requirements in amcas i'm leaning towards lumping activities in one date range and in parentheses short breaks mm -hmm. now courtney on the acomas application Right. They don't have this option, right? I, I don't think uh, breaking up into date ranges. Well, maybe they do. Right. Do they? Yeah. No, no, I, I would agree with that. I would say you would lump summit and then somewhere in the description, you would break it down. Or you can just, since you have unlimited entries, you could break it out by the date ranges that you did the same thing. So you have yeah. options that way. And then on the AMCAS, personally, if you are doing the same role, I would just put the start date, the end date, right? Get the total yeah. number and then just let them know um, if you want to. Yeah. Um, kind of that it was every summer or something like that, but I don't even yeah. know if you need to get that granular. Yeah, I, I have a general rule of thumb around, and it's funny you mentioned every summer because that's m the typical way that we mm -hmm. see it on the application is right. when students are doing something just in the summer, they'll do the add dates, add dates, add dates. Yeah. My general rule of thumb is if there's nine to 12 months, right, about a year maybe um, of a break between when you did something, I would I would split it up into dates just because there's a little bit of sketchiness to say, oh, I did it from this date to this date, but for a whole year, you actually didn't do it in there. And you're obviously not adding hours, but it changes the perception, I think, of the consistency of that activity. Mm -hmm. But three months, four months, five months, I'm like, ah, whatever, just, just lump it into one. So it's, it, I have this button on my soundboard, there are no rules, <laughs> right? And so... It's a general rule of thumb, just the the appearance of what you're saying uh, kind of gets different yeah. message there. Yep, I'd agree. Yeah. Um, Andres has an interesting question. Uh, is it too detrimental if I don't have medically related volunteer experiences, just paid? Apparently to that one uh, UC school. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so UCF, not not the California school, but University of Central Florida. Uh, Andres, um, I did an interview on the pre-mid years podcast yeah. about a month or two ago now yeah. with the director of admissions, Laurel, and she said part of part of their kind of scoring rubric, how how they look at things, is they want volunteer clinical experience. They they do judge that differently than paid, and so. One of those famous Courtney sayings in this world that we say every time, it depends. It depends. It depends. It depends. In general, though. Yeah. Courtney. I mean, in general, I would say get what you can get. Um, I, you know, it's helpful. The more clinical experience that you can get, the better. Just saying medically related volunteer experience, I'm not sure how far that's going to go. It depends on what your role is and what tasks you're doing. Um, and kind of what it's going to count towards. Being medically related is not the same thing as clinical hours, so you'll need to be careful with that. But sure, both are good. Yeah. 
Um, here's an interesting question. And Victoria, I would love to know what school this is. A med school had sent a letter of intent to announce that they are closing their primary teaching hospital. Am I warranted to tell them I am now reconsidering them as my top choice school due to uncertainty? Um, letters of intent, Courtney, they are not binding. They are not legal right. documents. Does Victoria right. need to tell the school? Uh, JK, LOL. From a director standpoint, I mean, it may be helpful to kind of know, but I may withdraw is not the same thing as I am withdrawing. I don't need yeah. to know about the maybes. If if you're going to do it, pull the trigger and do it. If you're not, yeah. then I don't need to know about it. If you're still weighing your options and considering other schools, that is part of um, this part in the cycle where you're kind of looking at all of the schools and, and committing to them. Um, I don't need to know about maybes, but if, if you really aren't going to come and you're dropping it out of the running, leave that seat, like, let us know then so I can open that seat for somebody else if I'm the director. So yeah, it's not binding though. So it, it, yeah. you don't have it's to doing a favor to the school, but right. for the student. Yeah. 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 I don't know. I I'm a little biased having never been a director of admissions. I'm like, they don't do students any favors, so why should we do you a favor? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it's which, kind of which for- may potentially hurt Victor, right? If he went to the school and be like, I'm really, really a little concerned here, they may go, well, screw you. We're not, we were going to offer you a, a, a spot tomorrow, but now we're not. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. it's tricky, Victor. Uh, let's see. Did Victor tell us what school I meant to say I was already accepted? Oh, so he is accepted. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. So yeah, I mean, you you have normal traffic rules, Victor. You you'll have to tell the school at some point whether you're going. Uh, SUNY Downstate, I think. Yeah, SUNY Downstate uh, is definitely mm -hmm. closing their hospital, which is very surprising. Uh, I don't I don't know why. Uh, ba -da -ba -ba. I did see that in the news. Baylor, if I am unsure what activities I'm going to be doing during this cycle, uh, May through acceptance, how can I make sure I explain this or do enough so that schools do not I do not assume I am just wasting time? Courtney, I see this all the time with applications. Typically, mm -hmm. students who don't get in, they send the application to me. I take a glance at it. Mm -hmm. And the application, unfortunately, is just a snapshot, right? It's not a living, right. breathing document that right. can be updated all the time. And, and mm -hmm. each each application service has different rules on what you can change, post-submission, all that fun stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I get a, a little bit of anxiety when I look at an application and I see all of the activities stopping in May of the application year. And mm -hmm. at that snapshot don't see that the student is doing anything else. What does that look like for you um, as a former director of admissions? Does it look like the student just doesn't know how to fill out an application? Does it look like the student is like, check, 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 done. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go play video games and and uh, go climb some some rock walls or something. Like, what does that look like? And and is that a potential detriment to an application? Yeah, I mean, honestly, I've I've heard a variety of answers for this. I've heard kind of at a national level that some schools don't really care about like anticipated hours or upcoming things. They're only gonna score you on the things that you've done up to that point. So it really wouldn't come into play for schools if their rubric is like that. Um, I would agree that if every single activity, including like volunteer experiences or your clinical are not, you know, things that are going forward, it would be a little sus. Um, but unless you're, I don't know, on the ACOMAS or on the AMCAS application, you only have 15 entries and it's not a cumulative ask or I guess glance at somebody's activity. So I, I would caution you to have all of your end dates completed and nothing going on. I mean, even your hobby or an extracurricular could carry over. Um, so, so it doesn't look like you're just stopping everything, but 
I don't know how hard of a magnifying glass they would put to that. It will vary school to school, honestly. Yeah. Um, awesome. One of the things uh, that students can do is have their application reviewed prior to submission, go, go into the application service, print out the PDF of everything that you've put in, and then potentially schedule a meeting with one of our advisors. Mm -hmm. I'm looking for the little um, ticker thing here. Uh, ba -ba -ba -ba, there it is. Um, uh, we have a promo code PMOH for pre-med office hours. Save 50% on um, just any of our advising sessions. You can do a 30-minute call saying, hey, I want to submit this in a week or two. Have have one of our expert advisors like Courtney, who again, former director of admissions, you looked at 100,000 applications. Um, you'll be able mm -hmm. to kind of at a glance go, I would change this. I would I would tweak this. Everything else looks great. You're good to go. Um, yep. <laughs> good luck. Godspeed. Right? Yeah, so I mean, that that's that's kind of what we do every day at this point is, you know, oh, there's a bunch of Blackhawks going by right now. That's interesting. Nice. Um, <laughs> right outside my window. Um, we, we look at applications. We're doing um, a ton of application renovation sessions right now where we're helping people who are either on the wait list or thinking that they're going to have to reapply and kind of helping them strategize or you know, maybe it was their personal statement, maybe it was their secondaries, maybe it was gaps in their experience and stuff like that. So I would say now would be the time because you have a little bit of a buffer if you do have any gapping or you do need to rework a lot of your essays. But yeah, I mean, it's actually what I like doing the most is um, kind of this strategy and reworking part. You've already put in all the work, but the packaging matters. So, yeah, yeah, um, definitely. So let me add that again. The uh, application renovation sessions that we're doing right now are awesome. Um, all right, more questions. Will my 1,700 hours working as a medical assistant and 2,800 hours working as a clinical research coordinator be enough to overcome my zero hours of shadowing? <laughs> Courtney, mm. um, I, I have no. it under some authority uh, <laughs> uh -huh. that there are schools out there, at least one well-known um, school that used to, maybe, maybe it's changed, used to, this was two or three years ago, uh, mm. rhymes with Schmarvard. Um, they uh, would screen out if you if you don't have shadowing on your application, yeah. you're you're screened out. Um, yeah. You said no, right? I think yeah. there's there's always this question of like, my GPA is bad, but my activities are awesome. Right. My activities are awesome, but I don't have shadowing, right? And it's just right. like it, uh, everything I, is separate, <laughs> right? And I would say it's not about quantity of hours. I mean, anything is better than zero, I would say. Um, quantity of hours is just one aspect of it. Shadowing is important because it gives you an opportunity to just purely observe in different clinical settings, different specialties, um, different day-to-day -day of a physician kind of day in the life. And it's an important aspect if you are trying to show a med school that this is something that you've explored and looked into and you have an awareness of what they do and you know that this is your path, shadowing is an important aspect of that. Working as a medical assistant, yes, you are around physicians and you're providing direct hands-on patient care, but I mean, outside of those four walls that you're working in and whatever type of clinic it is, you you won't be able to show that you have an understanding of anything outside of that. And so it's not the best look. And I would say, no, it wouldn't make up for that. Yeah. Remember, I would say, usually when we get any type of experience type question, it comes down to you're missing the point of why they're asking you to do certain things. Mm -hmm. There's a purpose for why they ask you to do a multitude of different experiences and have that in your record. And it's to provide you an opportunity to 
get to know about what physicians do in different areas, get to know what it means to provide patient care and have difficult conversations, get to know what it means to be employed and work as a team member, develop your interpersonal skills and soft skills. Like there is a reason behind it. And it's not just for sheer volume to see if you can make it through it. So every everything does have a purpose and shadowing is not something really unless this was during COVID times, but we are out of that and med schools are not going to give you that buffer anymore. So, yeah. Yep. 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 Uh, Jolie, I just got a re reject a rejection from UCF, but I did have medically related volunteer. That's good. Sorry. And obviously the application is more than just one thing, but right. yeah. Uh, sorry about that. Um, Let's see. It's interesting when people start getting rejections at this time in the cycle. Mm -hmm. If you applied on time early and stuff, and you've just kind of been waiting for a response, obviously you're in some type of holding pattern. You may not have been in like their bread and butter category where they're moving through those to invite for interviews. So it's a little bit telling, I would say, if you're just now hearing from them and getting a rejection. It, you didn't tip the scale. They didn't parse you out in the beginning, so there was nothing that crazy, but obviously you you didn't make it into um, kind of where the triage happens, which is post-secondary and into the interview pile where you go from a pool of 6,000 down to a pool of four or 500 that they can actually interview. So I'd be curious to look at the application and see if there are areas that you can identify that Yeah would tip the scale in your favor because it's an interesting time to get rejected. Yeah. Do you, do you think, and I've, I've had this kind of issue with medical schools historically, just the lack of communication. Do you, do you think it's just the school is finally just saying, okay, finally send the rejection email to all the students that we're not going to interview, um, which maybe, or do you think it really is, they weren't bad enough for an immediate rejection. They're not good enough for an immediate interview. And so mm -hmm. it's like this kind of purgatory of like, yeah, we we need some buffer of students, some applications, yeah. just in case we have to scramble at the last minute. Yeah. I'm, yeah. The second thing that you said, yeah. I mean, it's very much kind of looking at what's coming in throughout the cycle. And some you know you need to jump on, they're probably gonna get multiple offers and you wanna interview them early and kind of secure that seat deposit. Um, and others, you're you're not quite sure. They maybe haven't quite demonstrated a fit or or something else is having you not, not pull the trigger on that, but not enough to reject. So there is an opportunity. So yeah, you get put in just a holding pool. And that's why you don't hear from them. And if you open up for communication for people who are in that pool, which is probably pretty big, you will get bombarded. <laughs> and so that's why they always say, you know, don't call us. We'll we'll call you kind of thing, <laughs> because, I mean, the amount of communication on a daily basis you could get. You wouldn't be able to do any work in the yeah. admissions office, so. It's, it's not, it just is what it is. Yeah. You know. It is what it is. All right. Um, Very common question here about financial aid. Uh, mm -hmm. Do medical schools typically offer financial aid or is it just scholarships or loans? Mostly scholarships and loans, I would say. Very few scholarships are available. I would say if any scholarships are available, they're gonna be either kind of independent ones with stipulations that a physician group or an organization has donated to the school and it will be, you have to work with in a certain area after you finish residency or something like that, or even military. Um, mm -hmm. Very few scholarships. Yeah. So. And the loans are typically coming from the government, not yeah. the medical school, unless potentially it's a new medical school and they're not eligible for federal aid. Uh, sometimes there's some funding there. Um, and then there's a, a, 
sometimes a uh, carve out for international students who are not eligible for federal loans as well. Sometimes mm -hmm. schools have a pool of money for private loans directly from the school yeah. to the student. Lots of things there. Um, execration is leading a support group, non-clinical volunteering. Hmm. I, I, I mean, I, sure. I picture like leading an AA group or something yeah. like that, similar to a, a, a support group in that sense. Yeah. Yeah. If yeah. you're not getting paid, non-clinical yeah. volunteering. Go for it. Um... I love this question, Maheen. How do medical schools look at applicants with IAs? Those institutional actions, uh, cheating, um, plagiarism, alcohol sometimes falls under institutional actions, right. uh, depending on the school. Uh, automatic rejection? Some schools, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Let, let me be as, as transparent and honest as I can with this one. If you are caught cheating or plagiarizing, it's almost the kiss of death, I would say. Um, you will have a very hard time overcoming that type of sanction because you are going into a higher educational institution and there is probably some kind of question towards your integrity. Um, and, and they will put that they will tie the two of them together. So it, it would be very hard to overcome. You may want to get a letter from the school to kind of advocate for you or talk about what occurred and what happened. Um, some people have gone through kind of a probationary period and then they went on to serve on a board of trustees that helped other people who were flagged for the same thing kind of go into this you know recovery system or whatever. Uh, but those, those two specifically would be very difficult to overcome. Um, sanctions for like having alcohol in your room and things like that, as long as they're not repeated offenses and there's a buffer of time in between like when it happened and when you're submitting your application, generally those are easy to overcome or they are not scrutinized quite as much. So that's kind of what you're looking at. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Again, that PMOH code over at medical school, hq.net. I should put the uh, yeah. website on there. Might help. And uh, if, go check if, that out. If you do have a sanction, it's incredibly important to write about it in a way where you are taking ownership, you're giving a little 100%. bit of context, and you're talking about lessons learned and, and how you've improved since that point. If you are trying to blame a roommate, a friend, uh, something going on in your life, not going to look good, not yeah. going to look good. And then you'll, you'll just be booted. We've got other applicants that don't have those things. So, um, be very careful in how you write about it. Yeah. I'll, I'll never forget. I was standing, uh, I went to a conference, uh, talking to a director of admissions and a college advisor. And the college mm -hmm. advisor was, was asking the director of admissions. They were talking about a, a mutual student that they knew, yeah. uh, the student didn't take ownership for, I think it was a plagiarism, uh, mm -hmm. issue uh, mm -hmm. and the student didn't take ownership of it. The director of admissions was telling the, the, um, the pre-health advisor, like we will never, uh, seriously look at an application where a student isn't going to take ownership of something that happened. Yep. So kiss a death. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, I saw an application once a student <laughs> sent me their application, didn't get in, uh, had an institutional action, um, for cheating and, uh, the explanation, right. You get the, the character count to uh, mm -hmm. explain what happened. And mm -hmm. it started off I was wrongfully accused of, I'm like, done, <laughs> done, right? This thing went through <laughs> this whole, I, and I told the student, I'm like, oh, this my through God. process after process after process, and they oh. found you guilty. Yeah. You can't say you were uh, wrongfully accused of. So anyway. I mean, even in a court of law, in a lot of states, you were riding in the car and somebody else was doing something. You weren't participating. You were just there. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Yeah. Take ownership of it. You yeah. got the sanction. You got it.
is there. Sion, uh, secondary seemed to overlap with what I wrote in the most meaningful activity mm-hmm. section, as well as my personal statement. If mm-hmm. I tell a different story, the ones in primary is my strongest story. What should I do? Mm-hmm. This comes up all the time, Courtney. And, yeah. and my yeah. biggest piece of advice is treat them separate. Don't yeah. like, continue a story that you wrote in your, your primary application into your secondary application. And, and for the most part, right, you always want to answer the secondary questions as authentically and as strongly as possible without mm-hmm. word for word copying what's in your primary applications. Is it right. okay to tell similar stories from similar activities because that's sure. the best way to answer that secondary question? Sure. So I would say as long as it's not verbatim, totally fine to have a similar topic if that's what best addresses the secondary prompt, that's totally fine. Keep in mind though, that if you are so limited on the stories that you're telling over and over again, they're not really getting a good sense or a more global look at you. So you may wanna think kind of outside the box or at least outside of the pre-med path, maybe just life experience or a sport or something where you learned a lesson if that's the prompt so i would encourage you to if you have other opportunities to share things that are also strong and you don't have to be redundant it gives them new insight into you as an applicant um but it is okay to have some crossover yes yeah uh and then the same thing for interviews, right? A lot of students will yeah. will like freeze in an interview because they're like, oh shoot, like I answered that question exactly uh, on my secondary or my my personal statement. I, yeah. I need to completely give a different answer. I'm like, no, like, you give yeah. the best answer possible and that's okay. Yeah, I mean, it's up to you to tailor the story to whatever prompt. If they're asking redundant questions, that's on the school, right? <laughs> <laughs> that's on that's them for problem. asking um questions like that but you know tie it to um whatever the prompt is in the situation and, and don't just copy paste yeah yeah awesome awesome uh for someone who's already been accepted Fantastic. Mm-hmm. Congratulations. Um, mm-hmm. Is it okay to reach out to learn more about class content schedule, et cetera? What help sure. with decision making? A lot of schools have second look days specifically for yeah. this type of information gathering. Potentially reaching out and saying, hey, I would love to speak with one of the students, maybe. Mm-hmm. Student yeah. ambassadors are generally yep. available through student affairs or admissions. They have some students that you can talk to and get perspective. If you really want to get into the weeds, you can look at their forward facing student handbook, which is basically what you sign on to when you say you're going to attend the school. And that will give a pretty thorough look at how the curriculum is laid out. If you fail a course, what happens and things like that. So I would look at the student handbook if you you want to get into the weeds. Yeah. Uh, I thought you were going to go with uh, my arch nemesis, Student Doctor Network. Uh, it's one oh, of my goodness. Cool, I think good uses no. of Student Doctor Network is going to the school specific threads and seeing what people are complaining about because that's typically what those threads are are, are complaints um, because it, it gives you a sense of like what what mm-hmm. are people complaining about and if it's just the normal standard stuff, awesome. There, there was like, one school a year or two ago where there were some really deep-seated systemic issues that were coming mm-hmm. up. I think it was on Reddit where the, it popped up. And that kind of gave me pause to recommend this school. I'm like, there mm-hmm. may be some big issues at this school. Um, mm-hmm. So that's one of the only reasons I recommend jumping onto SDN is, is going into the med school forms, not the pre-med forms, but the med school forms that there are typically school specific threads there. Yeah. I, I've also seen a lot of falsehoods for that from one (laughs) salty person who is not being truthful and they want to kind of damn the school along with everything else. And so, um, I take everything with a grain of salt. (laughs) And if you ask, 
any single med student on any given day, they could complain about something. Yeah. It happens. Like, I mean, they're stressed out, they're invested in things, maybe it doesn't fit them 100% in this area and things like that. But I mean, you want to go to a school where they allow you to speak to students and at least hear that information from their perspective. If they are trying to safeguard that and not let you get any of this type of information, that may be problematic, right? So if they're gatekeeping, I, I would be concerned. Yeah, definitely. All right. Uh, interesting question here. Heather, I worked in hospitals, doctor's offices, clinics as a phlebotomist, lab assistant, x-ray tech for 10 years, and since worked in healthcare tech for the last 15 years. Can I count my work as clinical hours? So Heather, the, the famous, is it clinical? Working mm -hmm. in a doctor's office doesn't tell me uh, anything about what you did and what you're doing. Um, Working as a phlebotomist, definitely. Lab assistant, probably not. X-ray tech, maybe, right? You're interacting with the patients and positioning them and doing stuff. Um, work in healthcare tech. I don't know what that means. Like healthcare technology? Like clarify that a little bit, Heather. Um, and then she did have one other one that's really important here. Uh, also, is it okay if my LORs come from physicians and none come from college professors? Courtney, um, it depends, right? Yeah. Um, uh, I, you have a friend that I met um, at Sam Houston State. Sam Houston State is the school that I call out all the time because mm -hmm. they specifically have on their website, at least historically they have, um, if you've been out, they, they say, here right. are the letters that we require. If you've been out of school for more than a year, kind of sky's the limit. Send us what you got. Right. And I love that transparency. I love the fact yeah. that they're out there to save them themselves all of the emails. Um, right. Your students will still email. Well, I read that, but. <laughs> yeah. Um, Non-traditional uh, students that have been out, I would say generally the time frame is three years or more. That's the most common wording I've seen. Three years or more since you've taken a science course, then yes, you can use supervisors, you can use physicians, things like that. Um, if you have taken courses recently, you're bound to providing that type. You're not considered non-traditional anymore. So you have to be, you have to identify where you qualify per school, I would say. Yeah. And and some schools will go, oh yeah, non-trads, we love you. We understand the frustration right. and the heartache of reaching out to professors. Other schools are like, nope, rules are rules. Sorry. Yeah. Um, and, and a lot of that is they just they want to cover their butt and not not need to worry about variations for every student. Um, so anyway, yeah, I mean, it, I think it comes down to, you know, if if you've taken science courses recently, you should be able to obtain those letters. You have had the opportunity, and so they they are bound to ask you for those. Mm -hmm. If it has been so long that a professor could have retired by then, you know, there's a big gap in time that wouldn't really be equitable. And it probably wouldn't be indicative of the student that you are right now. And so that's why they provide a little bit of latitude in that situation. But if you've yeah. taken courses, yep, yep. you're going to have to provide it. Fun question here. We can talk about our friends at the PA platform. Do you mm -hmm. offer pre PA advising? So uh, medical school headquarters uh, is focused on med school. Our sister company, the PA platform, they joined us last year officially. Uh, mm -hmm. They do pre-PA advising. Go check them out at thepaplatform.com. Uh, Canadian friend mm -hmm. in Canada, shadowing seems to be discouraged. Definitely. <laughs> I think there's mm -hmm. one province where it's illegal, which is yeah. crazy. Um, whereas USMDDO, it's sometimes required. How do you apply to... Uh, U.S. schools and Canadian schools and present an application in a way that makes everyone happy. It's really that hard. That's a great Courtney. question. That's did, a great did question. Did you get uh, a decent amount of Canadian applicants at, at your school? Um, I've worked with a lot of them over the course of my career. Um, yeah. We didn't, 
I would say not specific to my school, but the discussion as far as serving on the council and then students I've worked with while I've been yeah. um, with MSHQ and things like that. Yeah. I mean, yeah. this is a great question. I would say the medical schools in the US, again, this is a very elitist um, application processing um, situation. And I would say they would still want to see shadowing in some way, but um, I mean, some may take into account that you're a Canadian student and understand that you wouldn't have had the opportunity, but I, I think it, it'll be school dependent on how much weight they put into that and if they'll give you any leeway on that. Um, yeah. they, they don't have to, is the thing. So, um, that that's a really yeah. tough one. It is. And, and that, what I typically see again, and it's unfortunate because it's like the, the haves and the have nots, the people who are privileged mm -hmm. enough to just come hang out in the States and have access to a physician. Right. They can come shadow. It's like, I'm going to, I'm going to take a vacation to the States to get some shadowing in. Uh, that's typically what I see happen. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's a bummer that there's, there's, uh, oftentimes that difference there. There's a lot of things that need to <laughs> that need to change. And this is that is one of them. Yep. Uh, former director of admissions at an osteopathic school. Um, hmm. What are your thoughts on MD LORs? Totally fine. Yeah. Totally fine. You have MD faculty that teach at DO schools, so doesn't matter. The only one is Arkansas. They require a DO letter of recommendation literally all of that. the other oh okay well that's great yeah i was just looking last week and i don't see that requirement anywhere anymore the Good. the choose do explorer removed that filter so i couldn't mm -hmm. find it there but i went to their school website i was specifically looking for that and i don't see it so okay hopefully it's changed <laughs> yeah uh confirm yeah literally all of the other schools even if that's not the case are totally fine with either one go with your strongest no issues. One team, one fight, uh, as we say in the Air Force or the military. Or <laughs> I learned that in the Air Force. I don't know if all the military says that. Uh, good question. What are my LORs? This is LOR day. Um, mm -hmm. By the way, I should mention my LORs, if you're applying uh, not to TMDSAS, using my LORs, uh, which is part of Mapped Pro, allows you to start submitting your letters now or having your letter writer submit letters mm -hmm. instead of waiting until May, they can start submitting them now. And what we can do with my LORs is we kind of QA them, quality check them. We look for a signature, we look for a date, we look for a letterhead, things that schools are expecting. And we are able to send a note to the letter writer and to you to say, hey, like, thanks, thanks for helping out here. You're missing a date. You're missing a signature. You uploaded the wrong, uh, the wrong student. Uh, we, we've seen that has it all. happened. Yeah. <laughs> we have I, seen it all. Yeah. I have seen that where it is the wrong person. Yep. So check out, uh, my LORs, which is part of mapped M A P P D dot com. And, uh, for 90 bucks for the year, uh, it's a huge, I think, anxiety reducer to have all of your letters in, you know, they're good to yep. go. And then when the applications open up, we transmit them to the application service for you and for, for the letter writer. We know people, uh, we know we people know. there. They Far accept the letters for us. <laughs> One of my LORs is from a job that does not typically write reference letters. Interesting. Would schools care if the writing style of the letter is different from more common ones? Oh, okay. Interesting question. So if this person is unaware, this letter writer is unaware of kind of the normal formats, does it, does it matter as long as the message is there, Courtney? As long as it still looks like a formal letter and not like a Word document, yes. <laughs> I, I think, yeah, as long as they're advocating yeah. for you and, and it qualifies under a category of one of the required letters, or maybe this is just an additional letter, sure, no problem. Yep. Go for it. Uh, love this question. Louis, Louise, how many activities are too few? 
I really, quote, found my jam with just a few activities, one volunteering, one in a high volume 911 system, and one in research. Should I be looking to do more? So three activities is what I count, Courtney. Yeah. <laughs> I only needed one hand for that one. Uh -huh. Is that bad? Um, I think that they will appreciate that there is longevity in the experiences that you do have. So if you get letters from these or, you know, people are advocating, they should have a pretty thorough understanding of you as a person since you've invested so many hours into it. It, it is a bit limited um, to kind of give them a global perspective of you and give them the sense that you have a very strong understanding foundationally of the physician role, since it doesn't really look like um, you're interacting that much with physicians. So um, yeah, this is probably too few. Yep. Too few. All right. Uh... Good questions today. Yeah, I love it. I sent out an email this morning saying, hey, come ask questions about applications. And I think it's helped. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, we got, got lots of fun people here asking questions. Uh, how do you best convey 70 hours of virtual DO shadowing, same doctor, different monthly topics, and 20 in-person MD DO shadowing across three different physicians, Canadian applying to US MD DO? Uh, actually, that's an interesting kind of going back to our Mm -hmm. our, our Canadian friend, virtual shadowing became a thing during COVID. Right. And that may be a way to say, hey, like I'm Canadian, we don't shadow here, but I did some virtual shadowing. Um, I, I'm wondering, right, this 70 hours of virtual DO shadowing, same doctor, different monthly topics. To me, that doesn't sound like shadowing. That sounds like like workshop workshops. Yeah. Um, I don't know. You tell me. Yeah, I mean, discussions aren't really the same as like shadowing, watching the day to day. But I mean, it's up to you to kind of help the person understand, I guess, what it is you were doing and, you know, what it entailed. So um, just be honest, just show what you've done. Um, and then kind of what you took away from the experience, I would say. Yep. Yeah, do your best there. All right. Wow, I'm gonna scroll down a little bit. We got tons of questions today. I'm gonna yeah, try to get some newer questions. Um, Another very common question, big fear, um, is activities uh, that are happening mm. right before the application. Uh, is that okay? Or should it, the, the question ultimately is, should I take a gap year? Should I should I put off applying so that I have a longer time period of doing the activity? Is there a, a blanket answer that we can give? Or is it hard? It's, it's hard to give. I would say if none of the hours have actually been completed and they're all anticipated and you don't have any prior clinical hours. So essentially you're going in with zero completed hours. Yes, that's incredibly problematic. And yeah. schools will weed out people with 520 MCATs, 3.99 GPAs, if it looks like they have zero clinical hours. I've seen them do that for people who had, you know, a thousand hours of scribing. They thought it counted as clinical and they got weeded out. So I would say some hours do need to be completed, not all need to be completed. Um, so it's it's a little bit of a gamble, but something's better than nothing. Something is better than nothing, definitely. <laughs> um, yeah, it's really hard. I, what I typically see when students especially it's like all anticipated hours. Students mm -hmm. are really kind of thrown off when I look at their application, they didn't get in. They have 1900 hours of clinical experience, zero completed, and it's all anticipated. And their description, which ideally for me, I wanna take away like, who are you in this role? What's your impact, all that stuff. Right. And all I see is 
in this role, I will be doing X, Y, and Z. And I, I don't have any understanding of, of who you are from that. So that's uh, a problem. Um, but the semester before apps open, so let's assume they started kind of January and they have a few months, you that's might okay. be okay. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah, I mean, if it's, if it's all anticipated, like how am I going to verify that you actually did start that job? Or if you're just hopeful that that's going to be something that you're going to have under your belt. But um, all I can really judge you on is what you have done. So it, it causes problems. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Good question. Uh, ba -ba -ba. Oh, Baylor, Baylor asked a quick question here. If I have a free trial of Maps Pro, which everyone gets for 14 days, um, but then my pro stops, will my LORs disappear? They won't disappear, but you won't have access to transmit them. Uh, they'll, they'll still be in our system. Uh, Mary asks a question, being an assistant manager and medical assistant at the same clinic at the same time, how do you put that on the application? 800 plus hours. Um, I, one of the things that uh, I love, Courtney, about this process, there's three applications. Mm -hmm services they each have right. their nuances a comus yeah. is very clear with their language it says if you have an activity that may span different categories put them both in don't double dip your hours right yep. your thoughts here? Yeah, yeah i would say in that one you can parse them out um in the texas one i think you can parse them out again because you have kind of unlimited entry um, with the AMCAS one, if you wanted to, you could put down in the experience description, like two bullet points, basically at the top that says, you know, assistant manager dates, the amount of hours per week or total number of hours devoted to that. And then medical assistant and blah, blah, blah. You could do it that way. Um, if it spans the same time frame, So you have a couple different options of how you can display it. Yeah. But don't uh, don't count the full amount of hours twice for each one. You need yeah. you need to be very distinct with what goes where or else it'll yeah. look like you're um trying to be misleading. Yeah. And, and I would challenge the assumption, right, that that being an assistant manager and a medical assistant are happening at the same exact time. Maybe okay. during an 8-hour day six hours are being a medical assistant, two hours are being an assistant manager. So, so Mary, you just need to kind of figure out what that ratio is, big picture, and, and split up the hours in that way. Awesome stuff. Again, use the promo code PMOH uh, if you want some help on your applications, one-on-one -on -one advising, um, essay help. Let us know how we can help you. That's what we're here for. We've had a really successful year too, might I say. Yeah. <laughs> With all the That's students a... that we've got into amazing MD schools and acceptances and stuff like that, especially, I don't know, I had a lot where this year where they really were doubting themselves and they're like, I, I don't even think I should apply to this place. I don't think I'm gonna get anything. I'm like, make them tell you no. I think you're a great applicant. Yeah. And then, you know, they have seven, eight, nine acceptances and stuff. And they're just, their mind is boggled. Like, yeah, come on guys. Like, do. Yeah. I, I think students think perfection is key and yeah. it's just not. not. Um, not. I got a message today from a, stu a student who got into UNC, uh, multiple C's on his application, had to take the MCAT four times and, and uh, was just accepted to UNC, uh, which is fantastic. Um, I've had multiple, multiple, um, people, parents and students reach out going, I'm very disappointed in my MCAT score. I got a 515. Should I retake it? And I'm just like, what? <laughs> like a 515 is a fantastic score. And, and the general way that I try to convey to, to students and to parents alike is, is your MCAT score, is your GPA going to keep the door open or is it going to close the door? A 515 will not close 99% of the doors out there. Um, so 
I, I think it's fantastic. I like working with students that kind of fall into the, I'm going to look like everybody else category where good to above average, like three, six science GPA, you know, that's the matriculating mean and like a 515. I love working with those students because yeah. it really is then, okay, academically you're solid, what else, right? Yeah. What is there beyond yeah. just your academic capabilities? And I feel yeah. like a lot, thousands and thousands of candidates fall into that category and they don't know how to jump out of that, that heavy, dense pool where most candidates fall. Yeah. And there's nothing yeah. wrong with them. They've got a good record. Everything is yep. strong, but they don't know how to stand out. And like, yeah. I love, I love <laughs> yeah. working so say, in that their, sphere. Yeah, you you say their stats are solid. The language I use, it's good enough, right? And, and yeah. students don't yeah. like that because they're like, what do you mean good enough? Like, that's not how you get into med school. I'm like, good enough, like, whatever. Um, it so, doesn't introduce risk, right? Correct. There's no clear and obvious risk. 100%. Um, yeah. And then that that pool right how do i stand out i generally don't mm -hmm. like that term but but it's it is. it is a way to like when when someone's scanning through an application you're like oh, it's like every other application and and then you, you get to one and you're like oh this person knows how to communicate to me right that is the difference it's right, right. it's it's not the activity the one activity that nobody else has that's going to help you stand out it's yep. how do you and, and i i get uh, we we get pigeonholed as the storytelling company, right? It's like, but it matters that is what connects. Um, and it so the, the the student who who took the MCAT four times and has multiple C's on their application got into USC. He he specifically said like storytelling really matters. Um, like yeah, it does. I mean, I, I've had uh, I had a parent reach out to me who's a physician. Um, he, he posted in a physician group that I'm in saying, hey, my son's not getting into med school. Can you help? He's got a 399 GPA and a 523 MCAT score. I'm like, send me the application. I'll take a look. Mm -hmm. His application is horrible, right? It, it's just like, yeah. I am really smart. I am really smart. I got these skills. Look at these skills. I should oh, be a doctor. Awful. It's so cringy. <laughs> and, and, and that is the typical application, unfortunately. I know. I know. I know. It's that, that seems to be for some reason where they're being guided and 100% that will not get you in. <laughs> yeah. If, if we're as med schools looking for people who will be compassionate physicians, you're not just smart. You have to have yeah. some type of interpersonal skills, which a lot of people have just kind of put aside to focus on the academics. And they've gone through the experience with blinders, just trying to accumulate hours. And now they come to us in personal statements, secondaries and interviews and just nosedive, just completely yeah. nosedive, even though they've done everything right up to this point. Yeah. That is not enough. <laughs> it's just it's just not everybody. Not everybody. Most people can do it academically. They've proven that most people will have the same experiences as you or very similar. Yeah. So what else? Right. And that's up to you to kind of work out and and share with them. And, you know, in the secondary show, paint the picture of why the two of you will be successful together. And so it very much does become about the essays and um, sharing how you've developed and what you have gained from having had very similar experiences to everybody else. So. Yeah. It matters. <laughs> it matters. Harrison asks a question. 511. Should I retake it? Applying this cycle as a traditional applicant. Mm -hmm. What are your subsections, right? <laughs> like, I would wonder, what's your major? Like, if you majored in biology, and biology is your lowest subsection, you're sitting right at like a 122, 123, but then the other areas are super high, potentially problematic. It's not just about the total score is about what the subsections can potentially indicate and what I can kind of make out of it. But a 511 is not a trash score. Um, it, it will be about more than just a 511. Yeah. Plenty uh, of 507s get in, thousands. Yeah. 
thousands of yep. 507s get in every year, you know. Yep. 511, solid score. Yep. Um, Describing not count as clinical experience? Uh, I would count it as clinical on your application. Let the med schools do what they're going to do. Yeah. Um, it's a common one. Celine is being a personal care assistant home health aide for a physically disabled person in home clinical experience. Definitely. Definitely. Uh, all right, Courtney. I think uh, I think that's good. Again, for oh. all of you out there. Um, if you would love some help with your applications, um, either you're reapplying, go check out applicationrenovation.com slash session. That'll take you directly to sign up hundred dollars for a 30 minute session with one of our advisors to take a look at your application. If you have already applied, this is not forward looking. This is a, a retrospective study, um, to, to look at your, your past application, um, if you are going to be applying, you haven't applied yet, uh, go use that promo code PMOH to save some money on a one-on-one -on -one session or packages or anything else so that you can stand out with your story um, and, and really convey who you are to the admissions committee and not end up in a pile of 399, 520 MCAT scores that uh, just fall flat, unfortunately. It's like we know what we're doing, you know? we. Helping people with this. Yeah. Final words of wisdom. Uh, we we often, uh, especially you and me, because <laughs> that's who we are, uh, we often get uh, kind of dubbed the Debbie Downers of the group, uh, mostly criticizing applications. That's just kind of the the way that we review things. But let's let's end on a positive note. What's something positive <laughs> we can say to students? A lot of students have already put in the hard work they have the skills and qualifications that the med schools are looking for and so just invest your time wisely and share that information in a way that the med schools can see how you've developed and how you've built a very strong foundation most people have already done the work it's just in the writing so Yep. Make sure that you're thorough and you give yourself every advantage that you've worked really hard for and dedicated a lot of time to. Definitely. As a reminder, we're here almost every Wednesday at 1 p.m. Eastern. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.